Jackson trying to escape and run for it. And he's got it more. Lamar Jackson down the sideline. Will they give it to him? They will. Touchdown, Baltimore. And with 117 left to play on Wild Card Weekend, the Hayes in the Barn. Oh my God! I wish you guys could. I wish we had a camera in here so you could see what we're doing. We're just a bunch of <laughs> clowns in here. <laughs> How much fun blast. is that? All right, welcome on back to another edition of the Baltimore Beatdown Podcast. It is Friday, December seventeenth. My name is Jake Luke. I'm joined. On my screen by Spencer Nathaniel Schultz. Uh, Thursday Night Football. We're both watching it. Chargers Chiefs. But we're here to talk Ravens Packers, I guess. How's it going, bud? TNF. It's going good. I'm doing about as well as uh, Terry Bradshaw's Peaky Blinder that he's rocking right now. God, Michael Strahan looks great. What a room that he has to himself. What a guy. What a, what a legend. Recently retired number. But yeah, we're cooking. There's a lot going on. I feel like we're going to have a fun episode or... Maybe fun, fun where it's always fun, but I think uh, we got a lot of like psychological deep diving to do based on just kind of the way things have transpired this week and some of the conversations that have been had and the twisted irony of kind of this purgatory that the Ravens are in, possibly without Lamar Jackson and things of that nature, COVID rearing its head, all those, we'll get to all of it, but and then, you know, speaking of the old cowboy, John Wayne, we got Kevin Costner, the younger cowboy or the more spry cowboy, John Dutton himself, Aaron Rodgers, a.k.a. the immunized one coming to town to kick the dog shit out of the Ravens. And and shame, maybe maybe the Ravens, what, 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 what Vegas is going to make them a heavy favorite on the road. Um, so I don't I don't know. It's just like. It's been a, a tropical hurricane, a tropical depression. It feels like it's turned into a hurricane of a season. And good old Johnny Harbaugh is going to have to weather the storm and lock up the doors and bolt down the windows and figure this out because it's a mess. It is a mess, and I, you know, I'm not any more comforted by the fact that uh, the Ra- the team that the Ravens literally just played is facing a situation that the Ravens essentially faced almost a year ago to this exact date, losing half their team to the COVID list. That would, of course, be the Cleveland Brownies, who are slated to take on the Raiders in Vegas on Saturday. They lost pretty much half their roster, including their starting quarterback, Baker Mayfield, and then his ostensible replacement in Case Keenum, Nick Mullins, the only other quarterback uh, on their roster, able to go right now. So you got Baker Mayfield, who you referred to as some sort of spunky Jared Goff uh, going after the shield on Twitter, uh, just emptying the clip uh, into uh, the weird processes that they're taking with COVID right now. So there's a whole discourse going on with Browns fans who are pissed off about the fact that this is going on. The Browns themselves seem pissed off about the fact that they are slated to play a game in two days. Uh, And I suppose I get that, but a lot of them are referring back to the Ravens situation that I referenced there with the Thanksgiving game and be like, Oh, well, you know, if you're the Baltimore Ravens and you'll get favoritism or you'll get the game pushed. It's like, you guys can push the game as, you know, as many days as you want here. But uh, the idea is not to do so, so you can get all your players back. It's to control the spread of the virus, which they did. And then the Ravens summarily trotted RG three out there uh, in the equivalent of a Viking funeral. Luke Wilson was like their leading (laughs) tight end in that game. I remember Minka Fitzpatrick prying a ball away from Luke Wilson in the back of the end zone. That was devastating. He caught that. They would have won. Yeah, possibly. And it was a funky game. Tyus Bowser making a play. I remember Bowser picks off Big Ben in the in the end zone, and he ran out like five yards and got tackled. And everyone was like, why are you? I was like, I'm still so happy about the interception. It's okay. Like, it's okay. Marcus Peters had it like on Wired. They're like, Marcus Peters was like, yo, you got to get down. Like, blah, 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 blah. But it was uh, that was a fun game, and I'm uh, slightly removed here. I think I, I'm seeing on I saw on Twitter a minute ago somebody listed and said there will, the Ravens and Packers could potentially be without nine Pro Bowlers in this game. Uh, I think they forgot to include Lamar Jackson. Oh, Lamar Jackson's yeah, he's a Pro Bowler. Never mind. But it was like you know the Packers don't have Jair Alexander, David Bakhtiari, Kenny Clark uh, tested positive for COVID, so he could definitely be out. And then I'm missing one. 
Zadarius Smith, and then uh, Aaron Rodgers isn't practicing. Lamar Jackson isn't practicing. Clayus Campbell isn't practicing. Marlon Humphrey's out. You know, all the guys on the Ravens, we don't have to go through that list. We've done it a thousand times. But uh, it's, it's just kind of kind of shows, and, and this might not be the, the best week for it, but it just kind of shows that in the NFL, you know, injuries aren't an excuse. And uh, you everybody wants to talk about their – kind of top of the roster, you know, top 10 pick or first round pick guys, you know, the, the loaded front end. Well, guess what? GMs should have more, I think, stock into their ability to have the right guys and the coaching staff to weather these situations. So I would say that comparing the Ravens and the Packers, two teams that, uh, you know, while the Ravens are trending downwards a little bit right now, they've found their first losing streak of the year through a tough time, but 18 combined wins between those two teams right now. And they, have a, you know, weird synergy of being able to roll through and, and next man up and all that good stuff. So you can't always go take uh, the the injury bug and and throw the season away in that sense. But man, does it keep on pouring on? Yeah, I think uh, it was PMT that was saying that uh, Ravens fans can rest easy now that they have the uh, injury card to pull, which, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm like trying to pull that or like pull an excuse or whatever, but it certainly does color my emotions of following this team right now you mentioned the word detached there is a little bit of a, a detached feeling i think heading into this game because it's kind of just like am i supposed to expect them to go out there and beat aaron Rodgers? like i don't know if i am but i don't think i do so here we are they are uh going into this game as i think five and a half point home underdogs i think the most under john harbaugh since 2015 which was uh the one losing season that he's ever had so up the steelers yeah it's it's looking pretty pretty dire at this point at least as far as this game goes uh i would say that with all the insanity going around about covid one nugget that was floated out there was that the nflpa was not only lobbying for this browns raiders game to be looked at but for the entire league to look at maybe pausing for a week which uh i'm not saying i want that to happen necessarily um and i'm pretty sure i don't either way but if that were to happen, I mean, you probably couldn't have asked for a better time for it if you're the Ravens, because Lamar Jackson not dealing with COVID, as some might have expected at a certain point back in the offseason, not dealing with that. He is not one of them, but he is dealing with a sprained ankle. And uh, there is some confusion as to whether that's going to be a long term thing, what it's going to be. It's, you know, whenever you hear sprained ankle, the immediate fear, at least I know this happens to me. And uh, I'm sure it happens to a lot of people, but high ankle sprain is sort of what you start to consider a little bit. And uh, it doesn't look like that's the case, but it looks like there is a there are some questions more so than earlier in the week. Like you had Ian Rappaport earlier in the week um, saying there wasn't a ton of concern, but then it turns out that he's not practicing these last couple of days. We're recording this Thursday night. So Lamar's status in question, who knows? Maybe this uh, maybe COVID will, in fact, uh, throw them another freaking bone here and uh, postpone the, the, this weekend's slate of games. But again, I'm not sure I even really want that to happen. Let's just, let's get through this season if we can. From what I've heard and what you touched on, you know, they're going to do the whole asymptomatic uh, able to get back out there with two negative tests as quickly as possible. So it's, it's tough. Um, you know, players might, some of I'm sure some of them are not happy about that. I'm sure many of them are. But it's the nature of the beast. I don't think COVID's going anywhere soon, unfortunately. So if you've got to roll with the punches here, it's uh, unfortunate. And I don't know, man. Uh, it's, just, it's just crazy that it's back. And we're about to watch this Thursday night game. No Chris Jones. No, actually, I think Chris Jones is hurt, but no Rashawn Slater. And all around the NFL, the Rams just had nine players go on the list today, including Von Miller. You already mentioned the Browns absolutely decimated right now. So it's running rampant and it's monkey. The only word that comes to mind is monkey wrench, man. This season, you know, fans have been able to be in the stands, which has been a beautiful, uh, can't think of the right word for re grace for re some beautiful to have fans back. I don't know. Alleviating. I can't think of the right word I want to use, but ultimately they, wow. The chargers are taking this kick back. Good cut. Oh no. He tripped. But it's been nice for fans to be able to go back, but it's it's come back up. You know, you you can't step on it. It's it's a cancerous situation that, you know, is is when, just when you think you've kicked it, it's coming back up. So I uh, I don't know what to do. I don't think they're going to postpone any games. Uh, we, it took 20 
for the Ravens last year for them in the midst of the true pandemic without fans or tickets or any of that involved. Exactly. It took 20 to delay it five days. Uh, and then there was the Titans bills game, which was delayed or postponed. And, and that was an interesting situation. So ultimately I uh, don't know what to expect in terms of the next couple of days, but again, in terms of, you know, guys, Nate McCrary, Chuck Clark, and Tristan Colon Castillo have all been added this week. And, you know, where there's a leak, uh, there's water damage. So when it rains, it pours, all those things. So I am led to believe that this is not the end of what we're going to see for who goes on the COVID list. And the Packers have Kenny Clark on there, who is one of the most underrated defenders in the NFL, one of the best nose tackles in the NFL, one of the best interior pass rushers in the NFL. Whenever they don't have him, their run defense definitely suffers. And so, I mean, the immunized one playing and Lamar not, well, we can, we'll get into all that stuff, but it's just a very funny situation. And it feels kind of, uh, you know, you, you said numb earlier, removed, and that's how I feel about it. They're going to play a football game. Probably there's probably going to be a lot of big names that we would have liked to have on the field due to injury or COVID, but it's not what we get. So this, this season with another game added that we haven't even gotten to yet has uh, really beaten up on the NFL. So it's it's going to be whoever whoever comes out on top. I think you could kind of like the, the Mickey Mouse asterisk, whatever. But really, it's going to be in my mind someone who is able to endure a really tough situation, a really tough year in the NFL, and the fact that there was no real good training camp or preseason last year. A lot of injuries this year. A lot of players whose bodies aren't as calloused. And I think that the, whoever wins the Super Bowl this year is is going to be legit, man. And it's looking like, you know, Bucks, Chiefs could be a possibility, whatever it is. But it's uh, it's been a tough season, and the Ravens are at the forefront of the uh, indoor that they've had to put forth. Yeah, I think you talk about, like, talk about, like, facing adversity league-wide right now with this COVID stuff. And I get that it's different than dealing with injuries. But you talk about a team that has just been absolutely just fighting every single step of the way fighting against what feels like fate and just the universe working against them every single step of the way well it's the ravens and it's everyone else i know their teams have had their issues but nobody has been hit with injuries quite like them at core positions every single freaking week it feels like so they've dealt with that covid is kind of bucking its head now and uh and you know kind of once again and affecting these teams in different ways but like if anyone's gonna complain and this isn't even necessarily a shot at like baker mayfield or whoever that's talking about having to play a game but like if anyone wants to like complain about the shit that they're have to go and having to go through i think they'd probably first have to submit their case to the ravens because it feels like you know the the rest of the league is kind of starting to maybe catch up fortune wise here with them at the very least which is not much of a comfort but uh hey welcome to the suck welcome to the suck and yeah, I mean, this Packers game, if there's these COVID mutinies, you know, throwing a monkey wrench into it can uh, have some weird... A lot of monkey wrench call-outs, and you're making me think of the Foo Fighters with those. Oh, yeah. Don't want to be a monkey wrench. Exactly. That's what we need. That's the, that's the kind of energy we need. We need Foo Fighters energy right now. Just got to keep on trucking through, but it's going to put... Uh, them in a conundrum and there might be some strategic advantage. Otherwise, you know, this, uh, the immunized one versus Tyler Huntley uh, could be quite ugly, but I, I think let's, uh, let's, let's go into a little bit more discourse because there's been some articles that have gone around and one that I'd actually like to pull up and go through a little bit. So Steven Ruiz of the ringer uh, had an article that kind of just hit on a lot of points that we've heard in, in summary of uh, Greg Roman's offense and, uh, I think Derek Clausen from Football Outsiders touched on some similar things. And I think there's just been a, a ton of um, discourse overall about these two coordinators. And it feels like regardless of how this season ends up, the Ravens are going to see a, a pretty big overhaul or turnover in terms of coaching staff, likely in terms of in the trenches, offensive line and defensive line with aging players on the defensive line, tons of injuries and weird situations that have panned out, uh, them trying to put Band-Aids on and it not fully working. And I'm, I just want to, you know, get into a little bit. I know that you were, you were, we, me and you were kind of talking about it on Twitter earlier, and I wanted to, to go through and discuss some of these things and kind of what it could mean moving forward, especially where we're in a situation where the Ravens, you know, are handicapped and are not going to be, I don't just don't think they're going to be a Super Bowl team. We'll see if they're even a playoff team. Hopefully so. I think they can pull that one out, but 
again, it's kind of uh, the same song with a different tune. And that's what we've worked into. So wanted to wanted to get into these a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, it's maybe that detachment that we were talking about that is maybe putting our minds a little bit forward into the future with this kind of stuff. Because like I said, this coming weekend's game, I'm not saying there's no juice, but it feels probably not nearly as consequential as we would have thought it would have felt even like a week and a half ago. So it's definitely put me in a little bit of mood of a mood, especially if we don't see Lamar this weekend to kind of take a look, take stock a little bit, because it does feel like we're what, four years into this thing now. So if you want to kind of look at life as certain pockets of time, certain, you know, years grouped together, first four years, maybe that's its own era. And whether he gets a new contract next year or not, it feels like we're entering a new era. And uh, it does feel like there is going to be significant change for one reason or another, as it looks like the Chargers maybe scored a touchdown there. I'm not totally sure. Uh, but it does look like there is going to be some changes, uh, maybe wholesale, maybe not. But I think we both maybe expect Greg Roman to be gone. I think we both, uh, to some of the points that I was making, and you know, I think like not, it's not especially profound to say that they need offensive line help, but maybe getting a little bit back to the, uh, back to the north-south ground pound run game a little bit sort of fusing that with some of the ideas they mixed in this year with the uh, passing attack and not even like really the ideas that they had there, but just the talent they sort of suffused through the, through the passing game, marrying that to what they got started out with Lamar, getting back to basics a little bit, I think will be helpful. And uh, I think we've been, we've been hinting at it. Um, and maybe you incepted this into me a little bit. I was talking about like, why not just make one of these in-house hires guys that know, Greg Roman's run schemes uh, a little bit and uh, can maybe move the passing game into the future. All that combined with a little more talent along the O-line, and I'm, I'm liking where they're going to be, but I did take a little bit of a look at that Stephen Ruiz article. I didn't have a ton of time to read super deep into it, but it does kind of remind me of stuff that like Ben Solak, who's also with The Ringer, has written at times this season, and Derek Clawson and other people. It just kind of feels like there are some things that need to be changed, and they probably... I don't know if I should say probably, but it feels like they're not going to necessarily happen under Greg Roman at this point. So I don't know if I, I would say like fire sale, wholesale change type stuff, but you know, it's time to take into a new era. And uh, that means more talent along the offensive line and maybe some schematic changes. Certainly. So being able to have that three years in Greg Roman system, you got John Harbaugh, you got and everybody, the notion that John Harbaugh can't go whip it up and go on a whiteboard and give us five hours of knowledge is just, asinine to me to think that someone like him doesn't have a finger on the pulse of all the details doesn't understand the play calls doesn't understand even the, even the stupidest coaches in the nfl know that stuff like by to a t exactly always. so I, I always scoff at that notion i i hate that one truly um so ruiz got into some things and kind of just talked about how roman wants to go heavy heavy personnel tight ends fullbacks and wants to be able to run the ball and how how creative he is in the run game which he obviously is and then he started getting into how that kind of limits the Ravens passing game, talking about jet motion. And when someone comes in jet motion, they're not able to attack vertically, uh, which I actually think we've seen dispelled a little bit this year. But I, I, I saw some back and forth and some people responding to it. So I was just curious, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, why is Rashad Bateman on the bench? Why is Pat Ricard on the field and instead? Yada, 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 so forth and so forth. And there's just so much that goes into these. And, and Stephen had a nice article and it's really hard to have enough you know, you want to make your point, you show supporting evidence, you put some numbers, it's a good article, but there, there just lacks certain things for me in terms of, uh, what, what do you want to do? I mean, he gets to the point where it's like the Ravens are 30th in 11 personnel. And what do you want to do? Do you want to run more 11 personnel and just put the pressure on Alejandro Villanueva and Tyree Phillips to hold up right now for, you know, four quarters, they've been facing TJ Watt, Miles Garrett, and or excuse me, Miles Garrett, then TJ Watt, then Miles Garrett, paired with Jadevity and Clowney for the last three weeks. Uh, the Dolphins have some talented pass rushers as well, and they've played some teams that have some pretty fierce pass rush. So uh, I, I don't see how, you know, just, all right, go run 11 personnel, increase the percentage of that. Is that doing justice? Is that what's going to be able to take advantage of, of these situations? And uh, it's like, oh, the, the article just kind of frame things, make it look like they don't really run 11 personnel at all, but that's still the number one personnel grouping they use. Yeah, they run it quite a bit. I mean, yeah, and that's kind of like where if you're a national writer sort of dropping into the situation, and like Stephen's obviously a very well-informed guy, but like that's kind of where you maybe lose a little bit of a nuance and context of what you're looking at. Maybe you don't necessarily consider as much that you're playing with Villanueva at the left tackle and then 
whatever hodgepodge smattering you've got going on on the right side, not to mention left guard is kind of a kind of a, a rotating, you know, revolving door as well. So it's kind of just like a systemic issue along the offensive line right now. And they do run a good a bit, good bit of 11, as you said. But I mean, I almost wish they would kind of put heavier out there more often to at the very least chip guys at the very least bring some assistance in there in there for these tackles that have just been kind of hung out to dry. So I don't know, like to me, like some of these articles are being framed as, oh, well, they're broken right now. Here's what they can do to fix it. And I hate to sound defeatist, but it's like, what is the in-season fix right now? It just feels like a little bit of a talent problem to me. Part of that due to injuries, part of that due to construction, whatever it is. But that's just kind of what I'm seeing. Right. And they like Brown, obviously. They sign Watkins. Watkins misses time. They draft uh, Bateman. Bateman misses a lot of time, misses basically the entire camp. And then Lamar has COVID, you know, all these things compound. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, like I was going to get into, and I think I veered off, is that I, I looked up basically just EPA with Pat Ricard on the field or with two back personnel and in the pass game. And it was substantially higher than it was when he's off the field. Uh, they are second in the NFL and EPA as a team, which includes Tyler Huntley. Lamar is second in the NFL as a quarterback in EPA when out of uh, two back personnel. And it was positive 27 for Lamar, I believe. And then uh, with, with Ricard on the field and then negative 16, negative 15.4, 14.5, something like that. So it's, it's like, you know, quite a, quite a drastic difference there. They're, they're able to successfully navigate there and, uh, I think that the marriage of the run in the past is a little bit overlooked, but uh, there, there's definitely some interesting things. Go check out the article. And he's, he's talking about motion and uh, defenders in the box and things of that. When the Ravens are a historic, or have been a historically good team running the ball and running the ball into heavy boxes, they averaged five and a half yards per carry last year against eight man boxes. So I don't really understand that part of it. Um, then he gets to a point where he starts talking about kind of the defenses that have succeeded. Of course he goes back to the Titans in 2019 and talks about that game and we all looked at that game and then what was peculiar to me is that he goes and looks at the new england patriots baltimore ravens game from 2020 and and kind of says how it mirrored what the titans did in a way and uh it certainly did but that game was played in a fucking monsoon like <laughs> they they couldn't really throw the ball so i, I don't really understand you know it seemed like you're not scared of the consequences of what can happen when they throw the ball because the wind is gusting. If you go back and watch the all 22, the tarps are like ripping up out of the stands in that game. And it was pouring down rain, super windy pouring down. So that was a little bit interesting to me, but uh, I agree with the general sentiment, which is essentially that in the end, it's time to move on probably from Greg Roman, because I don't think there's anything that uh, is going to advance. And I would, I would kind of just parlay into it that, for Lamar Jackson to be a great franchise quarterback, I mean, how often do guys have the same offensive coordinator for this, you know, incredibly long period of time? He's had time in one system, familiarity. They've been able to work to his strengths and draw out, you know, what they can cater to him. But then you can bring someone else who can build off of that. And I, I think that that goes, you know, with continuity being a good thing for a couple of years and then now providing the ability to expand off of it and have someone that Lamar is probably going to be interested in. And Lamar is going to want to work with and be able to keep some of the main components of the run game, uh, work in a little bit more zone, perhaps, and then evolve the passing game a little bit, get a little bit more creative, some scheme touches, some different conflict points and force defenders for defenses and uh, things of that nature. I mean, I'm sure Lamar Jackson and a Sean Payton offense would be doing absolute damage and would be able to negate some of the, the issues from not being able to run the ball and things like that. But then you kind of go look at Josh Allen in Buffalo this year. And he just had a great game. He's had a couple great games. He's also had a couple clunkers. They scored six points against the Jaguars in a game. And they can't really run the ball. So it's, it's kind of the polar, polar opposite there. And trying to find a little bit more balance, I think, is key and ideal. So uh, I think that James Urban is interesting there. I think that Brennan Marion is interesting there. We'll see what ends up happening at the end of the season. But I kind of just agree generally with the sentiment that it's time to move on from Roman. I appreciate the incredible run game the historic run game that has propelled the Ravens to the playoffs in three straight seasons and uh, allowed them to, to be super successful and, and can appreciate that for sure. But it is time, I think, to for Lamar not to just grow as a passer, but to understand a different system and different terminology and different perspective and different looks. And I think that's how you gain experience as a passer over time. 
getting a different perspective. There are so many different ways to skin a cat in the pass game and understanding coverage and how to read and how to, you know, uh, establish your hot read and who's going to, you know, be uh, your primary, primary read, where, where to look off, all of those things. So getting another flavor of that, speaking another language, going from Spanish to Portuguese, uh, is just going to make him more worldly. So I think that that is something that we're looking at. But at the other side of the sword is that, you know, I mentioned the offensive line. I mentioned the defensive line. Things that the Ravens need to address. Clayus Campbell, contract is up. Very old. Brandon Williams, contract is up. Pretty old as well. Derek Wolf is a really weird situation right now. Uh, on the offensive line, Villanueva has been horrible the last couple of weeks and month. Uh, and then going back, had a really horrible opening to the season and then struggled a lot as well. You know, uh, Stanley, what is going on with him? Is he ever going to be able to play again? Is he going to get back to normal? I think so, but... Uh, it's, it's definitely a question mark yet again. So with all of that, plus the fact that Wink Martindale at this point is probably going to get more coaching interviews and is probably someone that is going to be looked at as someone who's been on a winning team for an extended period of time, produced high levels of success, is uh, revered by his peers in the coaching community constantly, always, is someone who's great with the media, is someone who's really respectful. He, he does all of it the right way. The players like him. The media likes him. The coaches like him. So why would another team not like him? So I just think that this offseason has potential to be a real shakeup, man. And, and John Harbaugh, who has already been through that kind of twice now to a degree, kind of coming in and then doing it in the post-Ray Lewis years, and then I guess three times kind of coming in, mm -hmm. getting his staff together, doing it in the Super Bowl years, and then after that, and then again for Lamar Jackson and his current staff. So – uh, how many times can he can he go through that, man? He's been coaching a long time. So it's it's just a lot of interesting talking points, I think, here. Yeah, I think uh I think you're right. And I think uh to all your points about Wink there, he sounds like an anti Urban Meyer who uh got let go today by Jacksonville. So that was floated out there, and obviously a lot of people, myself included, uh in front of the show, RG three uh floated Wink as a potential candidate down there in Jacksonville. So that's gonna be one spot that uh, we might want to be looking at, and he does feel overdue for a job, and it does feel like maybe maybe the the band is kind of just sort of naturally coming apart a little bit, and uh, I think that's okay. Ultimately, to your point about learning new offensive schemes and becoming more worldly in that way, I think there's room for an organization and young players on this roster to grow with some changes in uh, those other areas. So if they have some uh, young minds on the defensive coaching staff that they want to bring up, maybe a Hewitt or somebody like that. And then maybe if they want to go to one of these other guys on the offensive staff as an internal hire, maybe they want to look at a Brendan Marion who has done some great stuff with Kenny Pickett kind of seemingly out of nowhere that, you know, kind of speaks pretty well to me and uh, you know, the potential that he could have to come into this coaching staff in at least some capacity and help out. And uh, you've been, you've been saying that guy's name since before anyone had any idea who he was. So I, I think I would like it just from the show perspective. Um, Maybe it could just be, you know, it could be a good thing to just kind of turn the page a little bit and enter a new era. And it all kind of lines up perfectly because like I keep hinting at, like Lamar is doing a new contract. And there have even been some questions raised about what's going on with that, like with his recent play. And I don't think it should be in any sort of question at all. But just with the fact that it is ostensibly coming up and I think it is going to happen this offseason, probably. And uh, if not that, then the next offseason, I think he's going to get it at some point. You're transitioning. and. uh instead of trying to paper over some of your holes or whatever you might have going through those, maybe it's you do the thing that Voss talks about where you kind of just turn the engine over and you take the year to sort of rebuild and get yourself ready to enter into that new year. Maybe that's going to happen next year, maybe the year after that or something like that. But it does feel like we are reaching a little bit of an inflection point, crossing a little bit of a Rubicon here. And uh, yeah, major change could be coming but they're still they're still eight and five i mean which which is weird to even think about yeah i don't i don't think that it's like a rebuild or having to turn the engine over i mean it's a john harbaugh football team and the irony of these conversations with lamar jackson and the contract are just so reactionary and uh nearsighted i think a lot of the time where six weeks ago pay him a billion dollars you know pay him everything that mahomes gets and then today it's like, well, should they resign this guy? It's like, how about you go somewhere as usual in the gray area instead of the white or the black area and in the middle, a Josh Allen type deal, four or five, six years, you know, 200 some odd million. 
that that team's not going to lose games. Lamar Jackson's not going to lose games like at a at a crazy rate. And when I say rebuild, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I do just want to make the point. When I say rebuild, like with this coach and quarterback, they can win ten games every single year for as long as Lamar is effective. That's... It kind of feels like, and I don't I don't want to put this in the negative light that people have about it, but it's like Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson. Like they're going to figure it out. They're they're yeah. they're going to be able to win games. They're going to be able to beat a lot of bad teams and be able to beat a couple of good teams every year. So. Exactly. Like they're going to be a double digit win team with Lamar and John Harbaugh uh, at this point, unless, you know, something crazy happens. They'll do it this year in the most difficult year possible where it's post COVID there's COVID going on right now. Um, You know, maybe they only win one more game, but I I have a feeling they're going to be able to squeeze out two more here. And uh, just being able to do it this year kind of just proves that no matter what ends up happening, they're able to be competitive short of 2015 where it was just, a run of ridiculously weird games. And then, you know, the quarterback goes down and then from there it, it was going to be a, you know, a a season where they are trying to get some younger guys, some playing time and and really had no talent left on the roster to a degree. You know, everybody's talented in the NFL, but they didn't have any top guys. Jimmy Clausen's playing games for you and stuff of that nature. So I'm just excited to see uh, what happens. I think it's gonna be a fun off season. I think there's gonna be a lot of talking points about it, but In the end, you know, Lamar Jackson, John Harbaugh is a winning combination. John Harbaugh and John Harbaugh is a winning combination. Same way Mike Tomlin is in this division. So it's it's going to be very strange. But as you said, you know, Mark Andrews said it last week before the Browns game. He was like, a lot is going right this year. We're eight and four. Like there's they're one game behind the Patriots who look like an absolute wagon. And everybody is they're kind of the Cinderella in ways. I guess this year they're the Cinderella of the NFL right now. And uh, the Chiefs, who have been a horse. Uh, the last month or two, they're they're one game behind those guys. So it uh, might be two, and they might kind of fall out with a, a tough Packers team coming to town and not be able to, to be first in the AFC North for the first time in a few weeks here. But then they go play the Bengals again, and maybe they're able to lick their wounds. The Bengals probably going to play in a, a knockdown, drag-out game this weekend, and we'll see what happens next week, man. I, I you know I'm going to count the Ravens out of this game. I think it's going to be a tough one, but – Bengals have to go play the Broncos in Denver. Traveling to Denver is always tough. Uh, the Ravens handled them this earlier in this season, but uh, the Broncos are a team with a winning record right now, playing some good football, playing some good defense. Their offense has found a groove. They're running the ball well. So uh, I don't I don't think they're terribly dissimilar from the Bengals overall. So it's uh, going to be interesting to see. I mean, the Bengals, for all that they've accomplished, for as explosive as they've looked, for the fact that they drum the Ravens, they're 7-6. and six. They're 7-6. and six. Like they're barely over 500 and not that the Ravens are much more, but they're right there. The Ravens are right there. I think this game's going to be tough, but a lot of people are just so down on this team and have been and, and kind of have, you know, they, they want to see the Ravens lose out. They want to be right. They want Greg Roman dead in a freaking tombstone uh, on top of him. Like nobody actually wants that. They say they want that because it's a self-defense mechanism against disappointment and sadness. Oh, exactly. they lose out. They should get a better draft pick. You don't actually fucking believe that. Nobody actually thinks that way. Unless you're like within get a better a, draft pick from 24 to 19 instead. Wow. That's yeah, really let's just lose out and get a better draft pick. Five fucking picks in the, in the first round when you're in the twenties already. Yeah. That's going to make a huge difference in turning your roster over. The only time I ever think that's acceptable to think that way as a fan is if you're like within a game or two of getting like a generational quarterback. And even when you're, even when that happens your correct way, you can get a you can get a Trevor Lawrence and you can fuck it up pretty quickly because you have a bad organization and a bad culture that got you into that situation in the first place. It's bullshit. It's ludicrous. People talking that way, you gotta get your fucking head examined. Certainly, man. I uh, I don't get it. I don't get where the uh, I just I don't, don't know. What's maybe I was a little more idealistic, or maybe I was a little more removed from it when I was a lot younger. Uh, back in the Ray Lewis days, and maybe there was just that much more confidence in, in kind of the leadership of that team. But it, I just it was it was kind of the same thing in Lamar's rookie year, where it's like there's so many so many fans within this fan base that just want want to suffer, and I don't I don't get it. I don't get, there's like something to prove about being right about losing or something. It's like they're one win away from a winning season with four games left already. So. You're, you're I, question what these going on. I, I question what these people have going on in their life and like what they what they how they perceive the world to be like the world is shitty enough to me. I want to have fun watching football. I want to root for my team like and that, that that's why that game last week was the definition of that. That's why that Browns game was the exact definition of that. Everything was down and out. You know, Lamar, I, I, I thought Lamar fractured his ankle uh, as, a, as a certified ankle boy. And uh, I thought I thought I was like, oh, well, yeah, he's probably done for the year there. It's only a couple weeks left. So 
Uh, no, low ankle sprain, and the Ravens freaking whip back in and and almost win it. So it's it's high entertainment value, and there's just this nasty, bitter disdain for so much that involves the Ravens right now. And I just I just don't get it, man. I mean, the day that Marcus Peters and Gus Edwards both go down within 30 minutes was like gut wrenching. It makes you have a, a balloon in your throat. You're like, I, I'm struggling to breathe. Wow. How am, is, am I getting, uh, pardon my take memed right now is memes getting me like how, like, is this a real alert that I'm getting on my phone? And then getting to the point where there were, you know, seven and three, six, uh, eight and three, six and two be, you know, winning some primetime games at home, doing all that fun stuff. It's, just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I feel like we've been policing f- policing people on how to fan lately, which is whatever. Uh, probably not a fun thing to do, but come on, man. Just enjoy just enjoy this run here. Enjoy yeah, this run. Do, do whatever you want, but, like, I can't – I personally can't I, – I don't I – have, I have no place for, like, disdain or negativity in my own heart for a guy like Devontae Freeman who got signed off the fucking street and probably thought his career was over. And then he goes out there behind this offensive line and is playing as hard as he is and, like, making the plays that he is. I don't have that in my heart for a guy like Lamar Jackson, who is going out there as a fucking lamb to the slaughter at times behind this offensive line and still making plays and still doing what he has to do. And like you have that game against Cleveland where, you know, he doesn't play particularly well, but he does just enough and produces some really fun highlights. And, you know, I was in the in the in the house for another win. I don't have it in my heart for guys like Anthony Averett, who, you know, he doesn't know if he's going to get another chance at a big contract or whatever it is, but he's playing out the string and he's stepping in for Marcus Peters and Marlon Humphrey and he's doing an admirable job. It's like, I just don't understand bringing like the, the negativity and like funneling everything, every little perception of this team through your hatred of like Greg Roman or whatever you, whatever one thing it is that you think it is an issue as opposed to like a bunch of a confluence of different things. I don't know. It's weird to me. It's, it's a little bit of a rant on my part, but I had to get it off my chest. The boo birds have just come out and they've been waiting so long on Greg Roman, they've been, and then, and then there's the other faction that's more kind of like national. Uh, the the takes of Lamar Jackson struggling are finally here. When six weeks ago he was on pace for like six thousand yards, almost he was on pace to break the through like eight games. He was on pace to break the NFL yards per game from scrimmage record substantially, and it was you know Lamar's great, everything's great. Keith Williams and T Martin are the reason why this offense is doing well and everything's dandy. The Ravens are so good. John Harbaugh coach of the year. And then in a, in a tough stretch of a tough season with a lot of guys on IR where they're still winning some games, they go to Chicago and beat a, you know, bears team. That's had a couple wins there. The bears beat the Bengals. And uh, you know, that's why we say it's a week to week league, but they were able to go there with Tyler Huntley and go win that one at the end. And, uh, I guess people are just kind of getting hyperized or uh, super magnified into the fact that these games are so close. And it's like, they almost would rather be able to just like watch the Ravens get blown out and give up on their Sunday. than like get really emotionally hyper and driven and want to, you know, have something to, to take away from it. And it's like, man, the fact that they almost won is the crazy part. Not the fact that they barely lost considering the circumstances. So uh, it's, it's just been a wild ride this season. And I think a lot of people are just worn out by it already. And, uh, are kind of like, can't take it anymore with how many close games they've played. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's really tough for them. So I, I want to extend my most heartfelt condolences and apologies for having to sit through this. And, you know, maybe, maybe we as a fan base will get lucky and we could root for like an urban Meyer led team or something next season. Exactly. So at this point, um who knows by the time this podcast comes out tomorrow or today on friday and there could be eight more packers on the COVID list there could be five more ravens so i'm kind of knows what the hell is going to happen the fact that they just played the browns like it's it's a little sketchy to me i i fully agree there and there's there's no proof of on on field transmission whatever whatever but hey man guess what the ravens and the bengals are going to be uh worst case t- have the same record next week it sounds like Lamar Jackson's ankle is probably going to be good to go by Sunday, December 26th, the week, the day after Christmas. Uh, and guess what, man? That game is going to kind of decide the division, it feels like. If the Browns play without all these players, they're probably going to lose. The Steelers are kind of in the back seat right now. And uh, that that game's kind of going to decide the division a little bit. 
uh, and then the Ravens Steelers at the end of the season. So it's, it's, it's all still in front of them. McCary should be back by then. You know, a lot of these guys should be back. And they're dragging through. And I'll tell you what, man, this is going to sound stupid, probably freezing cold take me on Sunday. But there's been a lot of tweets about uh, the Ravens starting secondary in August. Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, Deshaun Elliott, and Chuck Clark. And then now, Anthony Averett, Chris Westry, Geno Stone, and Brandon Stevens. This is stupid. The other, this, the August one is fantastic. All pro players, you know, highly paid starters, great, talented guys. But I think those guys can hang a little bit, man. I don't know about with the Packers, but... Brandon Stevens, Anthony Averett, uh, Geno Stone has been showing some closing speed and some smart plays a couple times here and there. Chris Westry, Wink was talking about him at the podium, saying how well he tackled. And uh, I think, you know, if he had a couple, he could have picked two balls last week. He kind of got that offensive pass interference situation. And it's a guy who's had two starts in his career, I think. So young guys looking to go make a name for themselves. I don't think these guys are all, you know, trash pile guys. I think that against the Packers on, on this week without Lamar there and a lot of guys, it's a really tough situation. And I do ultimately think the Packers are going to roll on them, but I'm excited to see that. I think those guys have some talent and I think they have some potential and I think they've got a lot to prove. So um, I'm excited to see what, what comes with that. Yeah. I mean, that's why they drafted Anthony Averett in the fourth round a couple of years ago for a situation like this. I mean, he's not a, He's not a no-name guy. He was starting for the best football team in the national country. champion college. Yeah, he won a national championship. Like you know, he's he's got some pedigree and these other guys too. I mean, Geno Stone, like he Iowa. That's no. There's a safety at Iowa. Those are those are yeah, ballparks, that's, that's man. That's no dog and pony show. And Kirk Ferentz, like you know, if if they're drafting a guy that you get, you got to think they're getting a good good scouting report from Kirk Ferentz, who has ties to the organization. So you know, they you know. They have their intel on these guys. I think they like them for the most part. I think Westry probably forced into action a little bit early, but it's going to happen. Brandon Stevens was a, th- was a third round pick for a reason. Like these guys, you know, maybe they're not ready for Devontae Adams to your point, but you know, they could, they could probably hang a little bit, play to play, hold their own, maybe let a few big ones through, but they had already been doing that, frankly. So. Right. And the Packers don't have Elton Jenkins, who for my money is one of the top five or 10 offensive linemen in football. He's still out. They don't have David Bakhtiari, kind of similar situation to Ronnie Stanley. And I would also throw Taylor Lewan into there, who has continued to play but really struggled. So uh, they're they're not without their guys, man. They they or I guess they are without their guys. I misspoke, but they have a lot as well. And they do have the immunized one, and he's fucking slinging dough as usual. All but one year this year where he ends up being injured and, and getting a coaching change. And, you know, those two things might have gone hand in hand to a certain degree, but it's, uh, it's an example. These two teams are examples of resiliency. There's three of their, really four of their like seven, I would say most talented players. They're without. Jair Alexander, Zadarius Smith, David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins. That's, that's a, that though, all four, all of those guys could go on an all pro team any of the last couple of years and, and you wouldn't be surprised. So uh, it's, it's going to be a, a rare game and, I, I feel like this is kind of where the, the the wheels come off the wagon without Lamar here a little bit. Uh, I think Huntley's a capable dude for sure. I think the Ravens think the same thing, but playing Aaron Rodgers, I mean, you to, in order to beat him, you got to really play a damn game, really from start to finish. And I think the one area that's a little bit weird right now and where a lot of people are looking are on special teams because the Packers is one of the worst in the last like five years this year. They had a living shit show against the – Bears on Monday night. Was that Monday night? Sunday night, pardon me. And Ravens are one of the best special teams in the NFL every single year. They are again this year. I know that the uh, Packers special teams coordinator was talking about how the Ravens are the gold standard and what he wants to achieve. And all the Packers fans were shitting on him for saying that. So there could be the the equalizer there a little bit. Special teams, the one of the three sides of the ball. And uh, this could be the week where it makes a difference. Yeah, definitely. Um what do, what do we make of Aaron Rodgers' uh, fake Southern accent? He's been in a cold place for a long time. I think it's more just like a like a draw. It's it's yeah. not like a Southern draw, but it's just like a you know I've I've been living in the a little bit of draw there a little bit uh, watching Lamar Jackson out there on the field while I'm here on the Pat McAfee show. Uh, like to appear on podcasts, although I haven't appeared on my close personal friend Joe Rogan's yet. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've been immunized. 
There, there's just a little bit of a twang there. I don't know fully what's going on, but he's from like Northern California. So what are we doing here, Aaron? Well, so is J- Josh Allen's from NorCal too, and he he kind of has that same ordeal going on. There, there. He just little... sounds like a generic like white dude in his mid twenties. I feel like Aaron is really kind of hamming it up at this point. I, like oh, I think yeah. Aaron sounded that way before. Aaron's got know? long hair, man. He's out in Wisconsin in the freezing cold. He's smoking so much weed, Aaron. I think he uh, is. I've actually bit. been on uh, ayahuasca. I actually did a little bit of a uh, ayahuasca ceremony uh, over the summer, and that uh, helped me to get back to where I need to be as a player, I feel like. Uh, all these injuries I've been suffering, I actually don't feel pain anymore after that ceremony. It's been uh, an interesting transition. So as to whether or not I've contracted COVID, I do not know, because my body does not react to pain anymore after the uh, ayahuasca that Ron White and I took down in uh, in Mexico. So, Ron White. Um, yeah, so he's the gunslinger, man. I think he's got a little bit of a, of, I think he's got a little bit of a, if you're in, if you're in Green Bay for two decades, almost. He's definitely more of a real cowboy than Big Ben. I'll say that because he's, he's growing the hair out and he's, he's doing the weird drugs and he's, he's, you know, he, he's, there, a, he's, he's a, a Northern bit. cowboy. He is. There's a little bit of Hollywood in Rogers. I know him and Clay Matthews used to have the, uh, who's more Hollywood joke. Um, he used to have the short spiky hair and the, the his eyes used to look a little bigger. Yeah, not so much recently because because a lot of the shit uh, that's been going on. But uh, I, I grew up a big Aaron Rodgers fan, so I, I'm at the very least an appreciator of what he brings to the table. One the, of the, the most beautiful players. thrower of a, the Aaron Rodgers throws a football the way God intended. Yeah, but like in a way that <laughs> in a way that like mo- other people can't. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Like he is the chosen one. In terms of ball placement, ball talent, all of those things. Watching him throw the last time he was in Baltimore, geez, man, what was it? 2013. 2013, yep. Uh, wow. Dallas Clark, one handed uh, touchdown grab. And the Ravens played the year he was hurt, which was, I guess was 2017 against Jordan Love. Or no, not, not Jordan Love, no, uh, Brett Hundley. Hundley. Yeah. Was it Brett Hundley? Yeah, Brett Huntley. Mike, Mike Wallace had that weird touchdown catch. That uh, sneaky one-hander, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was well, Baltimore 2013 then, and that is, to this day, to this day, the most beautiful thrower of a football I've ever seen. The way the ball was whistling. Had a deep shot to Jordan air. Nelson in that game who was just couldn't have been more wide open. I think he like just completely burned Ladarius Webb. Um, Jordy Sorry, Nelson is sick. But I'm excited to see that, man. I'm excited to see that again. He still has it. He's still ripping and dipping, and he's got the long hair now. He's a little different. He's, you know, got the got the, the crows on the corners of his eyes, the crow's feet. And Adrian Woodley. Exactly. He's he is he is what Big Ben thinks he is. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what we've been circling around here. And that's we can pretty much nip that in the bud. I think uh Big, well, I think Big Ben sees himself as a little bit more classical. I think Aaron is kind of a, a new age sort of cowboy. Like Aaron would be in the modern. He's like an Elon Musk cowboy. For sure. Um, talk about Teflon, though. So, you know, it, there's there's a lot of layers. I think we're getting closer to it. We're trying to unpack it a little bit more. Um, Aaron's kind of Aaron's like a cocaine cowboy in the 80s. He's running with the cartels. He's like an extra in no country uh in the group of guys that dies at the beginning spoiler uh maybe he's one of those guys i see a little i see a little javier bardem and aaron Rodgers. i'll say it yeah as far as like play style that might actually be a pretty good comparison although i think i've made that comparison to mahomes maybe and who knows i really pat ricard even i made that comparison so <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. I actually I tweeted a picture of because Pat tweeted like a picture that I Hubbard or somebody might have taken of him that he just looked like a complete menacing badass in the Bears game. And I tweeted like the the Anton Sugar picture next to it. And then like Lacey DaCosta like tweeted at me, scariest movie ever. And she did one of the little emojis. I was like, that's pretty funny. That's that's adorable. <laughs> that's outstanding. I have no recollection of that, and I'm happy that that happened. I, I feel like I probably witnessed it and we talked about it at the time, but we've, we've been doing a lot of tweets for a couple of years here now. Yeah. It's, they kind of all tend to run together, don't they? So whether I'm comparing the team's fullback to a uh, psychopath murderer or I'm uh, extolling the virtues of John Madden somehow still being alive, it, it all tends to kind of become one, which is comes out in the wash. It does. Yeah. The grand irony of all of this is that the Packers have a kick-ass run game, man. 
Um, AJ Dillon, who I love Mike Renner at pro football focus. I think he's one of the good ones for sure, especially in terms of draft coverage, his draft guide's awesome. He had him as undraftable and boy, oh boy, was that a, a hot, hot pile of dog shit uh, scouting report on AJ Dillon. He has been incredible this year. Such a power back. He's like uh tractor Cito, but shorter and, uh, and, and wants to hurt you a little bit more. Henry wants to run away from you and then stiff arm the shit out of you. AJ Dillon wants to physically dominate you. I'll, I'll go ahead and if we're going to do Ravens podcast, I'll give him a little Jamal Lewis. How about that? I don't think he quite has the runaway speed that Jamal had, but I think he's a four, four guy. So I, I see a little Jamal in that, man. He's a fucking brick shit house, and I love watching him play. I have him in all three fantasy leagues. And Aaron Jones, questionable again. I, or uh, I think he's questionable. He didn't practice on Thursday. I think that's more precautionary than anything else. But A.J. Dillon is a load. And this Ravens defense is strength on strength a little bit. You know, Aaron Rodgers has been tearing it up. He'll throw, he'll throw some tutties. He probably will again this weekend. But elite run defense, elite run offense. The Packers do some great things. Aaron Rodgers makes some great run checks. And I'm excited to watch that battle uh, take place. I, I guess Clayus Campbell is probably not going to be able to play in this one is what it's feeling like. So we're going to get to see Broderick Washington, who, my God, had a kick-ass game. Justin Matabike had a kick-ass game against the run. Josh Bynes making some crazy plays. These outside linebackers as well are warthogs on the edge right now. Bowser, Houston, Jalen Ferguson made a couple plays, and, of course, Odafe away are diminishing the soul of tight ends and some tackles on the edge and what they're doing. I think Justin Houston got asked at the podium a little bit about it, and it has been kick-ass, super stellar to watch in the run game. The pass game, probably going to get crisscross uh, applesauce a billion times by Aaron Rodgers on these tossers they like to run and some of these you know, uh, zone beating and, and uh, man switch forcing plays. But ultimately – I'm really excited to watch the Ravens front against this uh, beaten up Packers front. It's the same thing. Like I mentioned earlier, Bakhtiari out, Elton Jenkins out. So they're trying to make do as well. And I think the Ravens are going to be able to uh, stifle this Packers run game a little bit, and they're going to have to rely on some quick passing a little more so and do some interesting things. So I, I, I feel like this Ravens offense is probably going to struggle a good bit, but I don't think the defense is going to be that outmatched. Uh, Chuck Clark, a big loss, obviously. And if he can't play and isn't able to do the whole, you know, test back into it by Sunday thing. But um, I'm, I'm excited for this defense. I think it's going to be a fun, fun show in that sense. I think the Packers are going to end up winning on both sides of the ball, but I'm excited to watch what goes down for these young Ravens defenders, especially. Yeah. It, and it, it just, it does feel like the Packers have the weapons to be able to hang like obviously Adams and some of the other guys that they have Randall Cobb. I don't know like what his status is right now, but he's, you know, weirdly like made some plays for them this season. They always have like random tight ends. Like that. I think they got that Deguara kid or whatever this year. Who's like making Joseph some Deguara. Yep. Yeah. Deguara. So they're, you know, they, they got plenty of weapons. So I think Tunyon also tore his ACL. Yeah. Tunyon's well. been out. So I think that's where that Deguara came from. And the, they got the other guy, um, Lewis, I think his name is. So they're, uh, Mercedes. He's still, yeah, around. It, it is. Right. He's the big yeah. boy. Yeah, I forgot. I, I forget that that's him. I always see that name. I'm like, oh, who's Lewis? It's like, holy shit! It's still that that guy's still really interesting. So they have uh, they have him. They have the both the running backs that you mentioned. Obviously, are awesome. So it's tough, and uh, it presents a tough task for this offense on the other side of the ball to keep up, regardless of who's starting at quarterback. I think. Certainly, um, that that Packers team wants to run the ball a bit. I think uh, Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon, according to PFF, have combined to force. 52 missed tackles this year, uh, which is quite a bit more than the Ravens running backs have probably three, four times the amount, but they've got Rashawn Gary, who uh, was someone that it was, was an interesting, interesting scouting report, interesting scout overall as a player uh, coming out of Michigan. Obviously those, those Michigan edges, those Michigan down linemen are such dogs, but has really come into his own, been able to, to be pretty devastating, 58 pressure, seven sacks, uh, can bowl through you. I think he's got a he's got a little bit of Khalil Mack to his game, just in terms of like not the largest dude on earth. Like you know, uh, eh, maybe he probably is. He's probably six four, like two seventy, a little bit bigger than Khalil Mack. But my God, he can he can go right through you. They got Preston Smith on the other side. Was Adarius Smith continuing to be out? And he's kind of rounded back into form. Had a rough year last year, so they got a, a nice tandem there that's going to give the Ravens tackles 
yet again, a, a nice test. I can't imagine what it would be like to have to face a healthy Garrett, then Watt, then Garrett, then Zadarius Smith. So the Ravens get a little bit of a break there, especially it would be him coming back to Baltimore and doing some army crawl, you know, crazy psychotic dance, getting a sack. We could all see that happening, but uh, they've, they've got some dogs there. And, and one of the best acquisitions of this entire offseason, Devondre Campbell has been an all around horse in the middle of that defense. Campbell was on the Cardinals last year, a guy that you can go ask to cover slot receivers and man coverage and also fits the run well. So he didn't quite fit what they were doing in Arizona. They wanted to go into more of a lengthy type of Isaiah Simmons and Zaire Collins and Jordan Hicks situation. They were really asking Campbell to not play a ton of linebacker last year. More so is truly walking out into the slot and at times uh, out wide. But Campbell is a playmaker for sure. Uh, I think he's been on 800 and 803 of the 826 defensive snaps for the Packers. Very great signing for them. Has worked out really well. Uh, PFF has him with four total missed tackles and 87 tackles. So uh, one of the lowest rates in the league. So he's, he brings the speed. Their safety tandem is as good as any in the NFL. Darnell Savage, former Maryland boy. Uh, I think he's had some struggles this year a little bit uh, from, from kind of just the rumblings I saw on Twitter. But then Adrian Amos as well has been a huge signing for them. So they've got kind of like a Poyer and Hyde to them. A, a Baltimore boy, Adrian Amos. Exactly. A Maryland boy and then a Baltimore boy. So. They've got a nice tandem back there. Then their corners without Jair Alexander, uh, Eric Stokes, who can can run, man. Uh, he can definitely fly, has broken up a ton of passes this year. I believe he's been targeted quite a bit as well. Uh, I think we're looking at 71 targets this year. So he, he paces the Packers in that category. Um, done a nice job. And then Rasul Douglas has been another great addition that has stepped in and made a, a huge impact. Uh, five pass breakups and three interceptions. I think he has two defensive touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken, and has been able to kind of do some Marcus Peters-like stuff, kind of waiting on stuff, baiting it, and then snapping on it to the perimeter. So I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see him get his hands on a ball, get a pass break up or two, and and maybe a pick in this one. And I'm really just curious to see. This is the first time we'll see, and of course Lamar maybe, maybe could play still. I, I don't think he's going to, from the sound of it, not practicing all week and just how everything's gone lately and, and kind of what is the reward here in the end? I, I don't know. It's weird, but jeopardizing his ankle getting really bad ahead of the Bengals game just feels really freaking stupid uh, if, if that's the case at all. So I'm curious to see what the Packers throw at Huntley, kind of anticipating him and, and watching him last week and watching that Bears game. They've got some tape on him. And uh, Huntley likes to be a little more decisive and, and kind of take a one-step drop and freaking gun the ball to the sideline a little bit. So that's something that's jumpable. But we also saw him kind of squeeze some balls into Bateman and Hollywood on the perimeter. And uh, Hollywood had that ridiculous one-hand catch that was circulating. And uh, it's, it's going to be a real battle, man. I, I'm thinking that they're going to try and bait him into some throws and bait him into some situations. And I, I think you're going to want to talk about ball security for him, Jake. Yeah, I think uh, that's what killed him, right, on Sunday. Like, he played very much well enough that they could win. I think he probably outplayed Baker Mayfield. He certainly did in the second half. But really, that's what it comes down to is, like we've talked about, negative plays, sacks and turnovers. I was talking about their issues that they've had on third down this year. And I think you you kind of came back and said they've been actually better on first down than you might think. And certainly I, I could totally see that um, as far as like live plays with first down. But you got to avoid penalties on first down. We can't have positive play. Oh, wait a minute. That's coming back. Holding number 78 offense. We can't have these procedural penalties that they've been dealing with for two years now that kind of stuff can't be happening along the offensive line and then for Tyler you do have to stress ball security a little bit if you're going to be running around with it he had the two fumbles one of them not really his fault with uh Garrett just absolutely like I said just putting Alejandro Villanueva in a multicolored clown suit uh and then you had the scrambling fumble where it was kind of similar to the Lamar fumble against the Raiders where he's trying to make a play go for that first down I totally get it but Got to take care of the football. Got to keep yourself in the game. Got to lose a battle to win a war here and there with, if, to use a parlance that you enjoy, I think. Um, it's going to take pretty much all that you can have to beat this team and giving them the ball and giving them an opportunity to put you in bad field position with penalties is ultimately what's going to kill you. So it's definitely a little bit of a meathead football guy. Can't afford to turn the ball over. Can't get yourself too far behind the sticks take, but it just, I, I wouldn't be saying it this much if they weren't dealing with these issues week in and week out. So got to clean it up. Got to help Tyler Huntley out. Like 
Certainly. I think that he was probably about three or four plays away from having a damn near perfect game as someone that came in in the second quarter, kind of uh, the long reliever there, so to speak. So that ball security is an issue. I think that he could do, especially you got to, and then you use my, one of my favorite phrases, as you said, lose battles to win wars. The second quarter, maybe you should throw the ball away or fall down ahead of trying to really outmaneuver four defenders sometimes um, in the th- in late in the third quarter, fourth quarter balls to the wall, man, tuck that, tuck that loaf of bread and run and, and go, go be great. But no, when, no, when the, you know, no one to fold them. So it's easier said than done. It's guys running around a million miles an hour out there. You want to go make a play, but I think that time of the game can very much dictate the urgency of the need to do that. And you can always tuck the ball. You can put two hands on it when you're transferring. Do things of that nature. But the, I would the say, local yeah, bread, I would say if I'm him, like cut it loose in the run game. Like I think he looked faster against the Browns than he did against the Bears. I don't know how much sense that makes, but he looked uh, he looked faster. He looked slipperier. Um, he just looked a little bit more comfortable in a lot of different respects. So I think to what you were kind of saying there, like absolutely, you know, secure the ball down and do what you have to do and stress ball security, stress getting two arms around it, but also like use those legs and going back to the other point, like use them to, if nothing's there, fuck it, scramble forward and get three or four yards and put yourself in second and six. That's a lot better than taking a sack or throwing the ball away and being in second and 10 or second and longer. Like, you know, just, just let it slow down for yourself a little bit. That's probably easier for me to say than, uh, it would be for him with, you know, Rashawn Gary and all these clowns chasing after him. But uh, who knows? It, it, you know, just something to keep in mind. I, I lost my I lost the tweet. I think it was next gen stats basically showed that, of course, the Packers blitzed. I want to say, please don't hold me to the exact percentage, but 57 percent of Justin Fields snap uh, dropbacks. I can oh, I can look this up myself in pro football focus. Um but I think that they blitzed him at a really high rate and stuffed him when they blitzed him. So that's just that's just a nice Chianti with a fucking bloody steak for the Ravens and their struggles and what's been going on. Um, so that's something to definitely look out for. It felt like maybe they kind of recognized that they could take advantage of fields um, twice or take excuse me, take advantage of. Uh, similar struggles between Fields and then Lamar slash Huntley slash the Ravens offense. So uh, they they paired that one beautifully. And according to Pro Football Focus, Justin Fields was only blitzed seven times. So never mind. I don't know. I saw something on next-gen stats. So I'm talking out of my ass then in that one. My apologies. But uh, when blitzed, he was two of seven. Okay. So not great there. But I saw maybe it was on third down or something of the sort. But I, I just saw something about how the Packers dialed it up a little bit more so. And I'm curious to see the way that the the Packers address that situation. And we heard Greg Roman talk about that final play and uh, everybody wanting to like murder me and my, you know, family over my, the fact that I said Denzel Ward made a play. And now we kind of get a hint that um, maybe it's like- my uh, listener, Tim there, by the way, I, I, I got a, I got a good laugh out of that. Which is it? The Virgin like screaming, like, no, why would you call a play short of the six and the Chad? Denzel Ward made a play. Yes. Which yes. kind of looks like you, that Chad, I think. I think that's what that meme format is called. Yes, I believe that. Yes, exactly. Like the, it, you're supposed to be like the uh, wise, the wise douche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, exactly. But I'm just, just quite curious to see uh, how, how things play out against the blitz continuing there. It feels like again, you know, everybody wants to say that there's not the beaters, they're there. You just have to make it happen. And uh, there's there's so much that can go. We don't need to talk about that play, but trying to think of like, all right, maybe Mark Andrews can execute a rub a little bit better than James Prochet can in that situation. Uh, maybe there'll be a little bit more attention and, and trying to do some of these Darren Waller, Hunter Renfro, Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill kind of stack situations and, and play off of that a little bit more so. Um, so just being a little bit smarter with the – not the personnel itself, but kind of the layout of the personnel and some of those things I, th- I think would be a takeaway here. Uh, they, they trusted James Prochet to go, you know, rub in that situation it looks like and wasn't able to execute. And uh, I mean, all pro player made a play, but the the Packers have two really good safeties, man. Um, Adrian Amos, really smart. Darnell Savage, freakish athlete with a ton of range, ton of speed, can, can come and hit. And it's going to be a... 
going to be an interesting game. I'm, I'm just curious to see Huntley player who has, I don't really think put the ball through the air and a lot of jeopardy uh, in his snaps that he's taken this year or really much at all. Seems like he's kind of decisive and, and puts some heat on the ball a lot of the time and drives the ball confidently knows where kind of these soft spots are when guys are playing off. So uh, again, I, I see Rasul Douglas trying to kind of jump some of those based off what I've seen the last couple of weeks with him. And I think it's going to be a chess match here, but it's, it's going to be a tall task. And again, Kenny Clark is a huge loss and is going to take a lot of pressure off of the interior offensive linemen, especially in terms of pass rush, especially four man rushes where they're going to be able to spread out and uh, fan and, you know, do some, some half man or some slides and be able to help out with the tackles. So uh, curious to see in this one, how things pan out. And I, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, an interesting, interesting, interesting matchup on that side of the ball. And I just really would have loved to see Lamar Jackson play against this defense. I know he's not ruled out yet, but I'm not holding my breath on that one. How is this game going to pan out? I think that the Packers are going to be able to sustain some, some nice drives there. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, to this point, I believe has continued to kind of light stuff up uh, in terms of his touchdown interception ratio is going to be great. He can push the ball downfield. He can, you know, manipulate the defense so that Devontae Adams, someone we haven't even really mentioned that much in this episode, can straight up light you up. And I'm, I'm very curious to watch that transpire. I don't know how you're going to be able to prevent a guy like Devontae Adams from getting the ball. He is cooking corners, went in too high. He's cooking them in man, in zone. He's so smart. So I, I just don't know. Uh, how you're going to be able to hold Rodgers down. Looks like his his uh, big-time throw percentage from PFF, 6%. He's had 26, had uh, four in two straight games. He's had eight of those in the last couple weeks. Uh, Rodgers, 27 touchdowns, four interceptions, man. He has this toe injury, and over the last four games, he's had uh, at least 292 yards in each of those games. Uh, he's hitting a, a pretty high rate of yards per attempt and all those good things. He obviously is very, very difficult to sack. Uh, taking a couple sacks here lately. I know Robert Quinn got to him, so maybe we see Justin Houston try and take advantage. A somewhat similar rusher uh, is able to kind of get quick a little bit, and maybe Rodgers is a little bit hobbled, but uh, sack, sack three times or more in one, two, three, four, five games here, and a couple more two sacks. Been sacked in every game this year. So Wink Martindale said it best. you got to make him sore when he leaves the stadium. He's got to be sore on Monday morning if you're going to try and uh, beat this team. So I'm not sure how... It's exactly going to go, but I anticipate them being able to manufacture a couple touchdown drives. I don't think they're going to score any less than, you know, 17, 20, 24 points. And uh, I don't know that the Ravens are going to be able to conjure that up in a Lamar jackson offense. But uh, I think this Tyler Huntley kids at the brink of, and, and for people listening, pardon my take, they always talk about, you know, fake an injury when you're a backup quarterback who has a good game, fake an injury, and you'll make $4 million a year for the next 10 years and probably won't have to play more than one or two games over the, you know, over a two or three year span there. So if Huntley is legit at all, this is the game that proves it. If he is a legit player in the NFL, um, I'm, I'm curious to see how that pans out, but I just think that the run game is going to be complex. They're going to try and take advantage of no Kenny Clark. Uh, their their Packers are losing their player that has the most pass rushes by over 80 of any player on their defense and a really dynamic uh, nose tackle. So that's a huge loss to them. I see some complex runs being available. Packers have some some good play from Campbell and Gary against the run and some different things, but ultimately feels like the Packers can probably put up one, two more touchdowns than the Ravens can. And the if you want to knock Greg Roman, man, in these crucial situations of these two-point conversions and some of this you know goal line stuff, um, that's we've seen the vault. We talk about the vault. We joke about the vault. Du Duvernay's getting some touches. They're doing these uh, draw counter plays with little 180 handoffs and 360 handoffs, and have had some nice runs they've gotten out of those. But I want to see the run game in the red zone and in the goal to go, man. I want to see more, you know, on the eight yard line, able to hammer it in in a run or two, uh, some of that stuff. So I think if the Ravens have a path to winning, it's really establishing themselves on the ground. Latavius Murray being able to kind of be that zombie shark that I like to describe him as and cut through the, the holes there and see if Bozeman and Zeitler and uh, maybe, maybe perhaps Ben Cleveland play, plays in this one, Ben powers with a foot injury and hasn't practiced. So uh, curious to see if, if he gets inserted and if they can't 
kind of knife up and combo block and run some counter and run some power and go go make this Packers defense pay a little bit, maintain some possessions, keep Rodgers off the field. And if you want to beat him, you got to get pass rush. But Devontae Adams, probably going to light them up. Um, they have creative play ways to get other guys the ball. Aaron Jones and is, is definitely a major factor in their pass game underneath. And you'll kind of see those guys end up on the same side of the field sometimes. So I just – for Tyler Huntley to, to go out and beat Aaron Rodgers would be truly a spectacle to behold, considering that would put the Ravens at nine and five and considering the state of the Ravens and the season and the injuries and the COVID and all that stuff. But I uh, think if there's a game for the Ravens to, to kind of get rolled on, it might be this one. Yeah, maybe it will. So are they going to get rolled on? Let's go with, uh, let's go with a bit, man. Uh, Andrews, Bateman, Hollywood, Duvernay can make plays. Uh, I think they can maybe score a touchdown or two, kick a field goal or two. Um, so I, I think that the I think that the Packers are gonna. It probably will look somewhat similar to what happened against the Bears, but the Ravens' defense is schematically just more solid and uh, is better against the run and can can hold things down and out a little bit more, uh, even maybe without Chuck Clark. I don't I don't think we're gonna see a forty point Packers performance, but I think they can probably score thirty, and the Ravens probably can't score more than like twenty. So I've, I've tried the last two questions here to tee you up to give me your actual prediction, but I just, I can't get it out of you. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's because you go first, dude. I, I, I know, but I was trying to, okay. When you go first. You're not going to get, you're not going to, I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I'm going to do. Freak out. <laughs> not trying to bread. Not trying to get a laugh. Not trying to give them their worst day on the job, but do any of these fuckers. Um, okay. Packers 31, Ravens 23. Let's go Packers. Packers 28, Ravens 17. Okay. Packers ice it in the fourth quarter, kind of handle business a little bit. Uh, I think Ravens probably face like a big deficit again at some point. Shaking Bacon, Rashad Bateman makes some plays. Mark Andrews makes some plays. Huntley makes some plays. Turns the ball over a couple times and Aaron Rodgers is just too good. Unless that toe is getting worse and worse. Who knows? Yeah, it's not it's not that often that we uh we pick against them, uh, particularly not this season, but uh it just feels like the stars are aligning on this one, a little bit overmatched. Uh, and they will be going into the game against the Bengals at eight and six, it feels like. So that's that's our prediction. Anything else before we get out of here? Bengals game is going to be a huge one, man. Huge one. Worst, you know, worst case, both teams are eight and six. The Bengals have the lead because they have the head to head. And then you can go get Lamar Jackson back, get McCarry back, get some, you know, maybe Clay as Campbell back. You already played the Bengals. They've kind of exposed some things and you know how they are going to want to play you. Uh, I don't know that they're going to be able to kind of shift off of that. And I feel like the Ravens will be able to. So, I'm excited for that Bengals game next week, but hey, I'm excited to see Aaron Rodgers come to town and see what Tyler Huntley can do and some of these younger defensive players, Rashad Bateman as well, who's uh, got got that chemistry right now, Tyler Huntley. So let's see what they can make of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, bud. Is it time to get out of here? It is indeed. Make sure to, well, before Christmas, Christmas coming up, the Zoo Boot Wallet, our good friends over at Zoo Boot. 15% off of these beautiful aluminum RFID money clip and wallets with a beautiful finger slip podcast beat down. Again, that is podcast beat down at checkout for 15% off. You can customize them, make them in anything you want, a holiday special, a special occasion, or just a cool design that you like. You can put any kind of Ravens picture on there. You like, you can do whatever you want with them. So great gift, great stocking stuff or great for someone who uh, needs to up their wallet game, get something that they might like. That's like metal and, Kind of subtle as well, not real flashy or anything. So if you've got kind of that that gritty dad or grandfather and uh, they got the old beat up bifold, go check out Zuboot, our good friends there. Uh, podcast beat down for 15% off. They've got some great holiday specials going on as well. So go check it out. Enter that code and go get yourself a nice stocking stuffer. Up your own wallet game if you want. Up your wallet game with Zuboot. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, as always, um, like we said throughout today's show, a little bit of a weird spot to be in the season. So if you're still in a headspace to be consuming Ravens content, we appreciate it. We hope we are uh, providing you with therapy or we're whatever ombudsman you might need to uh, get your head in the game. 
maybe you totally disagree with us in which case that's totally allowed too but uh you know we're just we're at where we're at you're at where you're at it is what it is and it's not what it's not but uh Ravens got a game this weekend against the Packers. I know they're not going to be giving up. So as fans, let's not give up either. If you can go to the game, go to the game, have fun, and embrace the embrace the grind here. Only a couple games left in this 2021 season, which is weird to say. And who knows what's going to happen. But uh, until then, it's been a fun episode. It'll be a fun episode no matter what happens next time we get in here and uh, chop up the game for you on uh, presumably Sunday night. But uh, until then, thank you guys for listening. Follow us on social media at podcast beatdown on Twitter. You can find me at Jake Luke. That is L O U Q U E. You can find Spencer at Ravens Four dummies. That's the number four and get at us on Instagram as well at Baltimore underscore beatdown. Thanks again, guys. And we'll talk to you later. See ya. Arrivederci. Gorlami. Gorlami. Arrivederci. 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 Arrivederci.